Hello and welcome to the channel. Welcome to my review of the Necron Codex for Games of Warhammer 40k 8th edition. This is available to pre-order on Saturday the 24th of March and is available from Games Workshop and other stores from the 31st of March. Before we begin, I want to thank Games Workshop for sending it through to me and some other YouTubers and some other bloggers, uh, giving us these pre-order copies so we can release them, get them the information out there on the interwebs so you guys can hear about it and make up your mind. Um, my mind is pretty much set. This is a good book. I like this book because it offers a lot of variety and there's a lot of combinations in here. Now, I'm not an Ekron player, been up against them quite a few times, but just looking through it and reading what you can do, um, I've already picked up on a couple of combinations and a couple of powerful things that the Necrons can pull off. And uh, it's 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 good. It's good. It's it's a good book. Uh, it's going to be a tough book to a tough army to play against. And um, there's a lot of spice in here. So let's dive in. The first new rule is called their number is Legion. Their name is Death. And that allows troops to secure objectives, even if they're outnumbered by non troop units. Then we have dynastic codes and dynastic and there's a footnote about dynastic agents and star gods. So there are units listed below that can be included in a Necrons detachment without preventing other units in that detachment from gaining a dynastic code. Um, note, however, that the units below can never themselves benefit from a dynastic code. And that's Arkham the Traveler, Illuminor Seras, Trike Praetorians, Trike Stalkers and Saitan Shards or Satan. Catan shard units. Praetorians, um, if you know your fluff, if you know your narrative, they're the overlords. They look after the dynasties. They're, they don't get involved in that inter-dynasty conflict. And Catans, well, they're star gods, so they certainly don't benefit from any dynasty keywords. And most things in here do have the dynasty keyword. So wraiths, for example, have the dynasty keyword. I mentioned that because let's go on to straight away to these dynastic codes. So let's start with the last one first. Neferek, translocation beams. If a unit with this code advances, adds six inches to its move characteristic for that movement phase. If it's subject to my will be done, then add seven. And uh, in addition, if a unit with this code advances, its models can move across models and terrain as if it wasn't there. So race, for example, they move 12. And if you give them this dynastic code, um, translocation beams, then they're going to be moving 18 inches because they're going to add six inches to that. 18 inches is a long way, particularly when you have a look at one of the stratagems. And one of the stratagems is called Adaptive Subroutines. It's cost one command point. Use this stratagem after a canoptic, canoptic unit from your army has advanced and this unit can still shoot and or charge this turn. So, Wraiths moving 18 inches with that dynastic code. You pop a command point on it and then they can charge. If the average charge range is seven inches and you need to get one inch away, eight plus this 18 is a 26 inch move and charge across the board. Um, if you can charge 12 inches and you can, roll 2d6, 12 plus the one because you need to get an inch away is 13, 13. Add your 18 because you moved in advance. Basically, they've got a 31 inch threat range and charge. Wraiths charging turn one. They're going to be moving. They're going to be advancing. You're going to be using that one point stratagem to make sure they can charge after they advance. That's if you have Nefrek, Translocation Beams, Dynastic Codes. I like it. But imagine you can also do that with Scarabs. Scarabs have a 10 inch move. They can advance an extra six with the translocation beams and then spend a command point and they could charge after they've advanced. It's not just so much first turn charges. Imagine you're in turn three and these wraiths are suddenly moving 18 inches and then charging after moving 18 inches in turn three. They can get from one side of the board to another side of the board very quickly. That's a combination right there. Nasty. Now let's look at the Sautec. Um, dynastic code, relentless advance. I'm going to break this down into two bits. Let's do the second part first. So, in addition, unless the unit is advanced, so basically when you don't advance, a unit with this code does not suffer the penalty to hit rolls for moving and firing a heavy weapon. So that's the second part first, okay? So don't advance and you can move and fire your heavy weapons and there is no negative. 
let's think about doomsday arcs for just a second because doomsday arcs have the two shots right uh, low power and high power shot they're both heavy shots to get off the high power shot you have to stand still so it doesn't really come into effect there but as soon as you start moving the other shot is a heavy shot and it would be minus one to hit well now it isn't minus one to hit so long as you don't advance you're gonna be moving and firing that heavy weapon and the doomsday arc the low power and the high power shot used to be d3 and d3 shots it's still strength 8 minus 2 ap d3 damage for the low power shot and the high power shot is still strength 10 minus 5 ap d6 damage which is incredible but you need to stand still previously both of these were d3 shots only now they're d6 shots each which is crazy good unless you don't roll ones of course but uh, imagine if you managed to roll that magic 6 when firing out uh, strength 10, minus 5 AP, D6 damage shots. Or even moving the thing, because it can move 12 inches of Doomsday Arc when it's on full health. It is a Doomsday Arc, has got the fly keyword, it can move. And then chucking out D6 shots, it's still hitting on 3s, even though it moved. Now the real reason why this Dynastic Code really shines is because Destroyers. Destroyers are really good now. Um, the Gauss Cannon on Destroyers used to be two shots at strength 5, minus 3 AP, D3 damage. Now it's three shots at strength 6, minus 3, D3 damage. So previously, no one brought Destroyers, because with, with it being a heavy two gun, and a ballistic skill of three up, um, you had to stand still to try and get those two shots hitting on a three. As soon as you moved it, two shots were hitting on a four, and only one of them was hitting now it's three shots hitting on a three and if you move and if you have this dynastic code you're still hitting on a three because it's a heavy gun and you don't suffer the penalty to hit rolls for moving and firing heavy weapons three shots this is on a platform that moves 10 inches it only fires 24 inch range but that's a big change from potentially only hitting once because you were moving and hitting on a four to potentially hitting three times because you're moving and hitting on threes and the strength has gone up from strength five to strength six remember it's minus three ap d3 damage that's brutal now imagine a full squad of destroyers and a full squad i think is six of them yeah six of them add additional five destroyers so six times three is 18 shots these guys pumping out moving ten instead of previously that they'd have only been pumping out 12 shots and half of them hitting a full squad, 12 shots, half of them hitting only six. Now hits, now eight, say 18 shots and a lot more than six hits will be going in there. Math tells me that six of them will be hitting, 12 of them will be hit, sorry. 12 shots will be hitting instead of six. That's a 50% increase in damage output. Add to that a one point stratagem, extermination protocols. Use this stratagem in your shooting phase before shooting with a destroyer lord, a unit of destroyers, or a unit of heavy destroyers from your army. Reroll failed hit rolls and wound rolls for this unit until the end of the phase, and it's one command point. That's incredible. So destroyers are back in a big way. You're going to be moving them, you're going to be bringing squads of them, and rerolling the hit and wound and chucking out more shots if you have the sakuth. Um, or however you pronounce that, Sakteth, Relentless Advanced Discipline. That's crazy good. And let's talk about the first part of that dynastic code. If a unit with this code advances, it treats all ranged weapons as assault weapons. So basically, you can advance with these guys and still fire. So rapid fire one weapons will be treated as an assault one weapon. If these uh, destroyer lords advance, so you're moving them and moving them a bit further because you're advancing, then you treat those weapons as assault weapons. Um, so you can still fire after moving anyway. It's, it's good, I like it. Right, let's talk about the next dynastic code, Mefrit, Solar Fury. Each time a model with this code shoots at an enemy that is within half range of the weapon's maximum range, the armor penetration characteristic of that weapon's attack is improved by one. Now this one's also crazy good. <laughs> Because half range, AP plus one all the time, or minus one all the time. That's good. It's essentially getting closer and closer to this Necron army, or when it gets closer and closer to you, 
it would be like walking into a blender. How many psychic powers out there, how many buffs, how many auras out there are there in the 40k universe that allows people to increase their armor save by one? And it is seen as significant from a gameplay point of view. Well, this helps increase the AP of all of your shooting by one within half range. Um, it is going to be very, very effective. Suddenly your Gauss guns going up to AP minus uh, two. Those destroyers that I was talking about instead of AP minus three, AP minus four within half range, that's burning through power armor. That's no saves to power armor. Heavy destroyers with Gauss cannons, AP minus five within half range and their range is 36 inches. That's Mephrit Solar Fury is, is good. Mind you, they're all good. Uh, we've got Novok, oh, I'm butchering these names, but Novok, eh? Novok, Awakened by Murder. So let's say Mefrit was a shooty one, uh, Sakuth, uh, Sakteth, Sutek, I'm murdering these words. <laughs> the Relentless Advance allows you to move with our heavy guns. The other one was shooty, improved the AP within half range. Awakened by Murder is about assault. And this is, you can reroll all failed hit rolls in the fight phase when you charged or were charged or perform a heroic intervention. Reroll all failed hit rolls, regardless of whether you charge or are charged. So if you're bringing an assault based Necron list, so if you're bringing um, uh, your wraiths along, scarab spiders, flayed ones, lich guard, these old guys all have the dynastic keyword. They're rerolling to hit when they charge. Flayed Ones took a bit of a knockback. Flayed Ones used to have four attacks. They've gone down to three attacks. Um, but they were crazy good with four attacks. It was a bit crazy. And um, with their Flayer Claws, you can still reroll all failed wound rolls for this weapon. But a unit of 10 Flares, for example, that would be 30 attacks, rerolling a hit, rerolling a wound at strength four, you're going to be piling the wounds on there. Or Lich Guard with Hyperface Swords or Warside swinging away, re-rolling a hit. It's going to be nasty. Or even back to Wraiths, going to be nasty. Yes, Lich Guard only have two attacks, but their Hyperface Sword has gone up by plus one. So they were strength five, now they're strength six. It will come into effect sometimes. Um, smacking units with Gravis Armor, for example, when the Lich Guard went flying into... Um, uh, uh, into uh, what are they called? The jumpy dudes in scepters when they went flying in there, their toughness five, or a space marine captain in Gravis armor, toughness five. They were only wounding on fours, now it's plus one strength, so they're back to wounding on threes, wounding all space marines on a three up. So you can build a solid uh, list that is assault based to take advantage of that uh, dynastic keyword, I think. And then you've got the Nihilak. It's, you know, nihilistic, nih nihilach, I don't know. Aggressive, aggressively territorial. This is the last dynastic code, there's only five. Reroll, hit rolls are one for units with this code whenever they shoot, including firing overwatch, as long as they didn't move or they have not disembarked from a transport. So you need to stand still to do it, but rerolling hit rolls of one. Now, not being able to move is a bit of a pain, but your entire army with the dynastic keyword, say turn one, you set up some good shooting lines. Your entire army stands still and they're re-rolling hit rolls of one. What about that doomsday arc one more time? That doomsday arc barely moves anyway. It's got D6 shots. It's hitting on threes at strength 10. It doesn't want to move so it can do the high power shot. But hitting on threes, re-rolling ones, uh, just, just for bringing that dynastic keyword. So it looks like there's three here that are very shooty orientated. That one, the one that I just spoke about, is for static gun lines. You've got one that is supposed to, that is like stepping into a blender, which increases the AP value of all your guns within half range. And then you've got one which allows you to move and fire heavy weapons without penalty and allows you to advance. And then all your guns treat it as assault weapons. So one is mobile shooty and then non-mobile shooty and then stepping into a blender we've got one for assaults which is reroll fail to hit rolls in the fight phase when you charge or are charged and then we've got the one which just allows you to advance a long way then we have a mobility one 
So five dynastic codes, I can see uses for all of them. One for mobility, three for shooting, one for, one for um, assault. I can see uses for all of them. And canny Necron players out there, or maybe particularly filthy Necron players out there, will probably use two in the same army. You could use your shooty ones for your shooty stuff, and in one particular detachment have a whole detachment. When models in that detachment get benefit from one of the shooty buffs, and then have a second detachment uh, of, say, just Canatech Wraiths and Canatech Spiders with some Lord attached to them, and they're advancing and charging. Well, they're not advancing and charging, they're advancing six inches. And then you can burn that uh, one point stratagem so you can charge after you advance. Or just give them the Awakened by Murder one so that they're re-rolling hit rolls in the fight phase anyway. Um, talking about race, while we're on the subject of race, they got a bit more punchy as well. Because um, previously their assault weapons, Vicious Claws or Whip Claws, I think it was AP-1 and AP-0, but they're bo both at AP minus two now. And um, that's both two damage as well. So previously vicious cores were AP minus one, one damage. Whip cores, AP zero, one damage. Now they're both strength user, strength six, AP minus two and two damage. And whip cores still allow you to fight after you've been slain. You can fight once more time, one more time. Minus two with two damage, that's, they're scary. And more than that, Wraith Form has been improved as well. So Wraith Form was a 3-up invulnerable save. They still have a 3-up invulnerable save. But dig this. Models in this unit can shoot and charge even if they fell back this turn. That's just crazy good. So they're moving a long way. They're advancing a long way. They can charge after advancing with that stratagem. They're AP minus two and all their attacks. They're doing two damage with all their attacks and they can fall back and assault again. Wraiths. I've got to get me about 20 of them. If only they released a box set with some other army in it recently, then you could buy that box set with Wraiths if there were Wraiths in that box set and then split the other army with someone else who wants the other things in it. Um, they'd probably make a lot of money if they did that. All right, I liked all of them. I like all the dynastic codes. I particularly like the way it allows you to play the army differently. Let's look at these stratagems. The good thing about these stratagems is there aren't very many big expensive ones in here. Um, most of them are one points and there's some very, very good ones. Let's start with a 2.1 that I think most of you guys should be familiar with. It's repair sub routines. Uh, that way, uh, two points, you select a Canatep unit from your army that's on the battlefield and that unit gains the reanimation protocols ability until the end of your turn. I wanted to mention that because I was mentioning Wraiths. So for two command points, you can bring back Wraiths. And let's not forget with the reanimation protocols, when the models come back, they come back with all of their wounds. Wraiths have three wounds, so you can bring them back for two command points. Or at least get access to reanimation protocols and bring them back on a five up uh, with two command points. But let's talk about flayed ones, because it sounds like they got a bit of a hit, right? Well, one point, disruption fields. Uh, use this stratagem before a Necron's infantry unit from your army fights in the fight phase. And Flayed Ones are a Necron's infantry unit. Increase the strength characteristics of all models in that unit by one until the end of the phase. So, I see this stratagem mainly being played on Flayed Ones, but you could put it on Lich Guard or Praetorians or anything else for that matter. Talking about a really nice uh, close combat uh, stratagem, how about this for one command point? Use the stratagem in the fight phase before a Necron character from your army fights. fights. It's called Entropic Strike. Invulnerable saves cannot be taken against the first close combat attack made by this character this phase. Now, I guess it differentiates between the first close combat attack and the second and the third, just in case this guy can fight more than once. But imagine your warlords right up in the grill or any character up in the grill against, I don't know, Space Marine uh, Captain in Gravis Armour or a, let's say, a Tyranid Hive creature. And um, it can't take its four up and vulnerable save because you're smacking it. Now give it a relic. There's a relic called the Void Reaper. And the Void Reaper always wounds on a two up. Always wounds on a two up. And it replaces a War Scythe or a Void Scythe. And it has this following pro profile. It always wounds on a two. It's AP minus four and it does three damage. So 
your opponent isn't, if it's in a captain in Gravis armor, he isn't taking an invulnerable save or an armor save. If it's a Tyranid Hive creature, for example, Hive Tyrant, it isn't taking an invulnerable save or an armor save because it's AP minus four within. And uh, you'll be hitting on twos because you're a lord and you're going to be wounded on twos and you're doing a flat three damage for each wound caused. One command point, Entropic Strike. I like it. Another really good one is Quantum Deflection. So use this stratagem when an enemy unit targets a vehicle in your army that has the Quantum Shielding ability. So Quantum Shielding, so Monoliths have it, Annihilation Barges have it, a lot of your vehicles have it. And the Quantum Shielding is basically each time a model fails a saving throw, um, so you get hit by a LAS Cannon. You then roll a D6, and if the result is less than the damage inflicted by the attack, then the damage is completely ignored. So you hit something with a LAS Cannon, and on a you do four damage. If you roll a three or less, you just ignore that last cannon. Well, with quantum deflection, and um, you pick a vehicle before any hit rolls are made, and until the end of the phase, subtract one from rolls made for your vehicle's quantum shielding ability. So say you do four damage, then you roll your vehicle's quantum shielding ability, and you roll a four, and then you minus one to that because of quantum deflection, and you're down to three, and then you can ignore that damage completely. Basically, you just need to roll equal or less to the amount of damage that the opponent does to your vehicle to ignore the damage. That one's going to come in handy as well. Dimensional Corridor allows you to deep strike within 9 inches of your opponent. You need a monolith. So basically, use this stratagem at the start of your movement phase. All right, the very start of your phase. You pick an infantry unit from your army that's more than 1 inch away from an enemy model and remove it. And then set it up again so that it's wholly within three inches of a dynasty monolith from your army and more than one inches from an enemy model. So say you've got a monolith over here and it's about to get charged by some terminators or a dreadnought or something nasty or there's something nasty nearby it that you want to hit with your um, with your lich guard or you want to hit with your infantry unit or you can pick an infantry unit on the entire other side of the battle grid so long as they're not in close combat pick them up and uh, deploy them wholly within three inches of the monolith and more than an inch away from enemy models and then this is this is the good bit that unit counts of having disembarked from the model this turn and can move more normally <laughs> so you can get them out and then move them and then charge them so essentially you could slingshot an infantry unit from one side of the battle grid right next to a monolith, then move it, and then charge. It'll help if you want to punch something that's way within 9 inches of that monolith. It'll help if you want to get your guys out of dodge from the other side of the battle grid. I like it. There's a one point strategy for uh, Triarch Praetorians, which also come in the Forge Bane box set. Uh, these guys, use this stratagem before a unit of Triarch Praetorians from your army shoots in the shooting phase or fights in the fight phase. Add one to hit rolls for this unit until the end of the phase. So instead of them hitting on threes, they'll be hitting on twos when they shoot or when they assault. And um, they're pretty nasty uh, when they shoot because the Rod of the Covenant, it's only got one shot, remember. But it is strength 5 minus 3 AP. And they can smack you with it, which is strength user minus 3 AP. Or they can use their Void Blades. And if they're using their Void Blades, it makes an additional attack. So they'll have three attacks at a strength user so strength 5 minus 3 ap imagine a unit of praetorians which are infantry by the way which could just have jumped out of that dimensional corridor next to a monolith from the other side of the battle grid jumping out of that and then moving and then charging in with their floyd void blades with three attacks each hitting on twos at strength 5 minus 3 ap i like it it's only one command point i can see it being used Let's look at these two point stratagems. Dispersion field amplification. These are for Lich Guard. Lich Guard have dispersion shields which give them a four up invulnerable save, right? Well, for two command points, you can make it a three up invulnerable save and it acts like the robots of doom from the Abmech lists. So each time you roll an unmodified six for this unit's invulnerable saving throw, the unit that made the attack suffers a mortal wound after it's finished mating all of its shooting attacks. So two command points, you get your four up and run to a three up and run. And then your opponent shoots at you, use a stratagem in the shooting phase when an enemy unit targets the unit of Lich Guard. So then you burn your two command points. Say they're shooting you with lots and lots and lots of shots. 
say the rube robots of doom are firing at you the castellan robots from the abmec list because they can throw down a hundred odd shots right and then the guy is shooting away and then after you make sixes all of the sixes that you make to save bounces back and causes mortal wounds um that one is good I know it's good because I run Castellan robots in the Admech list and the number of times my opponents roll sixes and stuff bounces back and hurts them. And plus getting your invulnerable save to a, from a 4 to a 3 is just, is just good anyway. Uh, two command points, enhanced reanimation protocols. I think we know this one. You can re-roll reanimation protocols of one. Two command points, Wrath of the Catan. Uh, basically, after your Catan shard makes a power of the Catan uh, attack... Um, you roll a dice and then you automatically immediately use the power rolled even if it's already been used that phase. So the powers of the Gatan, as you know, or as we'll get to them in just a second, but the powers of Gatan deal out a lot of mortal wounds. If you're next to a unit or if you, most of them are 24 inch ranges, some of them are a bit shorter. But um, if you've got a couple of extra command points to burn, then roll two, roll a dice, spend two command points, and immediately fire off another power of the Catan. For two command points, we've got Methodical Destruction. This is the Satuth, the Sateth stratagem. This is for that army that has relentless advance, the one that can move and fire its heavy weapons without penalty, the ones that can advance and still fire their guns. They treat, as soon as they advance, they treat all their guns as assault weapons. This one costs two command points. And after a Sao Tech, I'm going to call him Sao Tech, unit from your army has an inflicted an unsaved wound on an enemy unit, add one to all hit rolls for all friendly Sao Tech units that target that unit um, for this phase. So you hit it, you wound it, everything else shooting at that unit will be hitting on twos pretty much because that's what uh, Necrons normally hit at unless they've got a degrading stat line. That one's good. Um, it's like Vengeance for Cadia. I forget what the name of that other strategy is. But that one's good, particularly as this is going to be a shooting dynasty. And then Reclaim Lost Empire. This is the guys who are aggressively territorial. These are the guys that can re-roll hit rolls of one if they stand still. Use this stratagem at the end of your turn. Select one of the units from your army. If the unit is within three inches of an objective marker or if it did not move for any reason during this turn, then until the start of your next turn, you can add one to saving row throws made for that unit and, inc and increase their attacks characteristics in the unit by one. So if you're standing still and shooting, you're re-rolling hit rolls of one. And then for two command points, you can dump this on a unit and increase their um, save by one. Um, Nefrect stratagem. Um, these are the guys who have the translocation beams. These are the guys that can advance an automatic six inches. They have a one point stratagem called Translo Translocation Crypt. And you use this during deployment. You can set up an infantry or swarm unit from your army in the crypt instead of placing it on the battlefield. And then at the end of any of your movement phases, this unit can translocate into battle and be set up anywhere on the battlefield that is more than nine inches away from enemy models. So basically deep striking in a unit of infantry or a swarm unit more than nine inches away from enemy models at the end of any of your movement phases. That costs a command point. So these guys can really get around. Not only can they assault six inches, uh, sorry, advance six inches, um, that's their dynastic code, all the guys in the unit can advance six inches, but for a command point, you can stick stuff in reserve and drop them down. Uh, the Novok stratagem, again, butchering these words. These are the guys who are awakened by murder. These are the guys that can re-roll all hit rolls when they fight. Their, command, their stratagem costs three command points. And what you do is at the end of the fight phase, you select any Novok unit from your army and that unit can immediately fight for a second time. Um, I guess if they're fighting, so you can re-roll all failed hit rolls when they charge. Yeah, um, if they charged this turn. So if they charge in this turn, then 
then they're re-rolling all their hit rolls in the fight phase, then drop this three command points on them, then they can immediately fight for a second time, and they will be re-rolling all their hit rolls again, because they charged that turn. So when you absolutely want to kill something dead, three command points, that's the way to do it. Again, a big unit of flayed ones re-rolling hit rolls twice, double attacks. Three command points, so it's a bit pricey. Then the Mefrit Stratagem. Um, these are the guys whose AP increases the closer they get to the enemy. Uh, use this before a Mefrit unit from your army attacks in the shooting phase. Each time you make an unmodified hit roll of a six, you can make one additional hit roll for that model with the same weapon against the same target. These additional hit rolls themselves cannot generate further hits. Three pages of strategies. I'm not going to go through all of them. <laughs> Some of them aren't very good, but most of them are. Here's a couple more. Resurrection protocols. When a Necron's character from your army dies, excluding Trezan the Infinite or a Catan, uh, roll a dice, and on a four up, he gets up again with one wound left. Yes, you've got to spend a command point, and then it's only a 50-50 chance. And it does say this stratagem cannot be used to resurrect the same model more than once per battle. But you, it could be at the very end of the turn that you're about to lose your Warlord. You might want to burn a command point for a 50-50 chance to get him up again. How about damage control override? One command point. Pick a vehicle, any vehicle from your army until the end of this turn. Use the top row of that vehicle's damage table, regardless of how many wounds it has left. Back to that Doomsday Arc, firing at full effect, or a monolith, firing at full, full effect for one command point, no matter how much damaged it is. Here's a nice cheeky little one. Self-destruction. Uh, it's basically a Canatep Scarab Swarm. You move your swarm in, and for one command point, you can pick up one of the swarms, one of the bases, and then roll. So you pick it up, you destruct it, self-destruction. Then you roll a dice, and on a two up, the explosion takes out D3 mortal wounds on your enemy. The enemy unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. It does say one swarm, so you can't charge in with the Necron Scarab Swarm and blow them all up, doing multiple D3 mortal wounds. You're doing it on one one thing. But I like it, it's a, it's a chance. Say you say there's some, yeah, I like it, it's good. It's, it's fluffy. Right, I think that's enough of the stratagems. Let's go on to the powers of the Catan. But before we do talk about these powers, let's talk about the Star Golds for a moment because the Deceiver, the Nightbringer, and the Transcendent Catan used to know one power, and they could cast one power. Now they know two powers, and they can cast one power. They can still only cast one a turn every turn, but they know two, so it gives you a bit more options. And you've now got six powers of the Catan, rather than just the three you had. So more in your toolbox, more to play with. Then let's talk about the Tesseract Vault. That's the big floating vehicle with the Transcendent Satan in the middle of it. Previously it knew three powers and could cast three. Now it knows four powers and can cast three. Still cast three, but it knows one more. Uh, that degrades depending on how damaged the Tesseract Vault is. It used to do that. So it used, basically you could cast three, then two, then one, depending how damaged it was. You can still only cast three or two or one, depending on how damaged it is. But it knows four. Uh, one more thing about the Tesseract Vault while we're on here, it now has a trans-temporal force field. This model has a 4-up invulnerable save and that is huge. And the reason why a 4-up invulnerable save is huge is because this thing is toughness 7 with 28 wounds. Toughness 7 with 28 wounds and a 4-up invulnerable save on it? That's crazy. I mean, uh, Imperial Knights don't have a 4-up invulnerable save. And they don't even have 28 wounds. This thing's got 28 wounds with a 4-up and vulnerable save. And that isn't to shoot an attacks or anything. It just says it has a 4-up and vulnerable save. So even if you go up and punch it, it has a 4-up and vulnerable save. Meanwhile, there's a Catan inside of it firing out 3 or 2 or 1 powers of the Catan a turn, every turn. Um, so Tesseract Vaults are... they're going to be brutal. The Tesseract Vault is going to be particularly brutal when you consider the powers of the Catan. So you used to have Antimatter, Meteor, Times Arrow, and Seismic Assault. You've still got those three. Um, they all were 24-inch range. Now two of them, Antimatter, Meteor, and Seismic Assault, are 24-inch range. But Times Arrow has gone down to 18-inch range, not 24. Why? I don't know. They still do what they do. There's still an opportunity for you to cause mortal wounds on your opponent. Antimatter, Meteor, for example... On a two up, the closest visible enemy unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. That's what it used to say, right? It still says that. However, on a six, that closest visible unit suffers D6 mortal wounds. 
And if the, you're a Tesseract Vault, then on a 5-6, that enemy unit suffers D6 mortal wounds. So if a Tesseract Vault is firing at something on a 2, D3 mortal wounds, on a 5-6, D6 mortal wounds. Times arrow. Pick a visible unit within 18 inches of the Catan Shard and roll a D6. And you add one to the result if it's a Tesseract Vault. And if you beat the wounds characteristics, you remove that model from play. Um, seismic Assault. Roll D6, uh, pick a visible uh, unit within 24 inches of the Catan Shard and roll a D6 for each model in that unit. Add one to the result. If the Catan Shard using the power is a Tesseract Vault for each unit, for each roll of a six up, that unit suffers a mortal wound. Say there's a big horde of bad guys. Say there's like 20 or 30 models in the horde. Um, it's not unusual to see uh, 30 horde models these days. 20 horde models these days. Yes, you've got to get sixes to remove, um, to cause mortal wounds. But if it's a Tesseract Vault, that's on five sixes causing mortal wounds. So if there's a visible enemy unit within 24 inches of you and it has 30 models in it, and uh, Tesseract Vault does mortal wounds on a five up, that means you're going to be doing 10 mortal wounds. <laughs> that's a lot of mortal wounds. Right, then other three, we've got Sky of Falling Stars, Cosmic Fire, and Transdimensional Thunderbolt. Sky of Falling Stars, pick up to three different enemy units that are within 18 inches of the Catan Shard and roll a d6 for each, subtracting one from the result if the Catan Shard is a Tesseract Vault. If the result is less than the number of models in that unit, that unit suffers d3 mortal wounds and an unmodified roll of six will always fail. So you're doing d3 mortal wounds. To three units, roll in a d6. Um, so long as you roll less than the number of models in that unit. It's nice. All three units have to be within 18 inches of the Catan Shard, but one could be behind, one could be to the front, one could be left, it could be all over the place. Sky of Falling Stars, Cosmic Fire. Roll a d6 for each enemy unit within nine inches of the Catan. Every enemy unit within nine inches of the Catan. Add one to the roll. If the Catan Shard using this power is a Tesseract Vault on a 4-up, that unit being rolled for suffers D3 mortal wounds. So your Catan's wheeling in there. There's three, four, five enemy units around you. On a 4-up, you'll do D3 mortal wounds to that one, and then that one, and then that one. It's 9-inch bubble. That one's good. Transdimensional Thunderbolt. Pick a visible enemy unit within 24 inches of the Catan and roll a d6. You can only pick a character if it has more than 10 wounds. Add one to the result if the Catan shard using this power is a Tesseract Vault. On a 4-up, the chosen unit suffers d3 mortal wounds. Remember, if it's a Vault, that will be on a 3-up. The chosen unit suffers d3 mortal wounds. Then, roll a d6 for every enemy unit within 3 inches of that unit. And on a 4-up, the unit rolled for suffers a mortal wound. So... Powers of the Catan, lots of opportunities to cause mortal wounds. The sky of falling stars will hit units way out, uh, will hit units, multiple units at the same time. Transdimensional Thunderbolt will hit multiple units at the same time. Cosmic Fire can hit multiple units at the same time. Remember that there is that stratagem that you can use called Wrath of the Catan. It costs two command points, but then you roll a dice and you can immediately do another Catan power. They can only do one per turn. Is this enough to make people start bringing Catans? Because you don't see much influence. You don't see them on the tabletop very often. I'm going to say no. But is it enough to make them bring Tesseract Volts? I'm going to say yes. Because all of these dice rolls are improved by one with a Tesseract Volt. And a Tesseract Volt has got 28 wounds and a 4-up and vulnerable save. And it isn't going anywhere for a long, long period of time. So... Yeah, that's the powers of the Catan. It seems like so far that this is Codex Destroyers, Wraiths and Tesseract Vaults, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. You may have those models already. You may really want to get those models. But um, I certainly wouldn't want to play against a list that just has Wraiths, Destroyers and Tesseract um, Vaults in because it, would, it just sounds absolutely brutal. Right, artifacts. Let's talk about the artifacts or the relics. The artifacts of the urns that you can get for the Necrons. Um, we have, um, there are six uh, melee weapons in here, or six shooting weapons, six pimped up versions of weapons. One of them we already mentioned, which was the Void Reaper, which always wounds on a two up. And um, 
four of them relate to the dynasties themselves. So the Abyssal Staff, the Baltic Staff, the Blood Scythe and the Solar Staff all re re uh, are part of the dynasties. You need to have that dynasty to have that relic. Remember as well, when you pick relics, it says you can't give them to the Catan shards. So I know there's probably a few of you thinking out there already. One minute, if I give them a shard. No, you can't give them to um, Catan shards. You can only give them to characters and you can't give them to named characters. So you can't give them to, I don't know, the Storm Lord. He's already got a relic. Out of the dynast dynastic ones, there is one that isn't a weapon and it's called the Time Splinter Cloak and it's for Nilharlark models. Nilhala. These are the ones that are aggressively territorial. It's the ones that stand still and can reroll hit rolls of one when they shoot stuff. So they have a relic and it's a once per battle relic and you can reroll a hit, wound or damage roll made for the bearer of the Time Splinter Cloak. In addition, Roll a dice each time the bearer loses a wound and on a five up it doesn't lose a wound. Okay, two pages of relics. Uh, there's two more weapons that you can pick, um, which are not dynastic. The Void Reaper we mentioned and the Gauntlet of the Conflagurator. Uh, the Gauntlet of the Conflagurator uh, can only be fired once per battle and this weapon automatically hits its target. Roll 1d6 for each model in the target unit that is within 8 inches of the firer and that unit suffers a mortal wound on a roll of a 6 up, so that isn't great. But let's talk about the other four that are non-shooty. So these are the four other standard relics that anyone can take. One minute, there's another one, a fifth one, we'll get to that. Uh, the first one's the Orb of Eternity, so a model with a res orb. The Orb of Eternity replaces the res orb. And then once per battle, immediately after you've made a reanimation protocols roll, you can make reanimation protocols rolls for models from friendly dynasty infantry units within three inches of the bearer. And when making these rolls, add one to the result of each roll. So once per battle, after you've made your reanimation protocol rolls, roll again for a, a friendly infantry unit within three inches and add one to the result. Doesn't say it can't stack with a cryptex. So remember, cryptex nearby, you're getting reanimation on a four up. This thing, Rian's on a, will give you a three up if you've got a cryptex nearby. And you've just done your reanimation protocols. So you've got a big unit of 20 guys, and a, a bunch of them got murdered, and there's only two left. You roll your reanimation protocols, use your Orb of Eternity um, once per battle, and then roll again. I like it. I can see that one coming. Lightning Field. The bearer of the Lightning Field is a four up and vulnerable save. In addition, roll a d6 each time, uh, d6 for each enemy unit that is within one inch of the bearer at the start of the fight phase. And on a four up, that unit suffers a mortal wound. The Nightmare Shroud. The bearer's save characteristics is improved by one, i.e. a four plus becomes a three up. In addition, enemy units subtract one from their leadership characteristics while they're within six inches of the bearer. Veil of Darkness. Once per battle, at the end of any of your movement phases, the bearer can use the Veil of Darkness. When they do, the bearer and up to one friendly dynasty infantry unit within three inches of the bearer are removed. Then set up the bearer and the second unit, if you chose, anywhere on the battlefield, more than nine inches away from enemy models and within six inches of the bearer. So I like that. I like anything that allows you to move stuff. Uh, completely redeploy an army. I think m the movement phase can often win or lose you a game. But the Veil of Darkness wants to battle, pick up an entire unit with your character and dump them somewhere else nine inches away with your character. And then we have the Nano Scarab Casket. And this is for a model with Silactri only. And the Nano Scarab Casket replaces the bearer Silactri. The bearer of the Nano Scarab Casket regains D3 loss wounds at the beginning of each of your turns rather than 1 from the Living Metal ability. And in addition, the bearer also regains D3 loss wounds at the beginning of your opponent's turn. The first time the bearer is slain, roll a D6. And on a 4 up, the bearer is set up again at the end of the phase as close as possible to its previous position and more than 1 inch away from enemy models with D6 wounds remaining. Um, that's good. <laughs> you D3 wounds in your turn and your opponent's turn and you can't kill him because he'll get back up again on a 4-up, 50-50 chance, but with D6 wounds remaining. Um, those are the main um, uh, relics.
Let's look at the warlord traits, starting off with the dynastic warlord traits. Saratek is the first one, again murdering that word. These are the guys that if they move their heavy weapons, they don't fire, uh, they, they can fire their heavy weapons without penalty, or if they advance, then all their weapons count as assault weapons. Those guys. These are the guys that Imatek the Stormlord um, is a part of. If you bring along Imatek the Stormlord these days, by the way, he's got a new ability called Grand Strategist. You get one extra command point. And Imatek the Stormlord, as well as getting an extra command point, will have this Warlord trait or any Warlord that you bring from the South Tech, which is basically you get command points back on a 5-up. Each time you spend a command point to use a stratagem on a 5-up, that command point is immediately refunded. So there's your command point farm. Mefrit. Um, Mefrit Dynasty adds 6 inches to the maximum range of all assault weapons fired by your Warlord. In addition, your Warlord can shoot assault weapons at enemy characters, even if they are not the closest enemy model. These are the guys whose AP value goes up when you get within half range. Their AP is improved by one. Oh, probably worth mentioning as well that the Sautek one, um, all of the named characters in the book, such as Nemesis, Andrek, and Vanguard, Oberon, or Vargard, Oberon, and they're all um, part of the Sautek dynasty. So they've all got that command point farming thing. The exceptions are Illuminor Serres. He hasn't got a dynasty. Arca, uh, An, Ankar. And Rakat and Raketeer, the Traveller. The Traveller guy, he hasn't got a dynasty. And Trazin the Infinite is Nilath, Nilhailak. What I'm saying is, apart from those three that I named really badly, they're all Sautek. Um, so let's go back to the Warlord traits. I'm flipping through pages here. Um, Nil Nihilak. Nihilak. Back to Nihilak. Trazan the Infinite is from Nilak. Nihilak. Your Warlord always fights first in the fight phase. Right, okay, done. Uh, Nefrek, skin of the living god. Your opponent must subtract one from hit rolls that target your warlord. Um, this is the dynasty that um, have the translocation beams that advance six inches. And then Novok, these are the guys that uh, re-roll all fail hit rolls when they fight. And each time you roll an unmodified hit roll for six in the fight phase with... For a model in a friendly Novak unit that is within six inches of your Warlord, you can make an additional hit roll for that model with the same weapon against the same target. Basically, you've got um, uh, Death to the Vols Emperor there. And it's got a six inch bubble on it, which is pretty good. So your, your Warlord in the middle of some charging guys, um, six inch bubble reaching out. And it says, uh, for a model that is within six inches of your Warlord, not a unit. So you can't do the daisy chain thing. All the models within six inches of him will get those extra hits on sixes, not the whole unit. Uh, obviously the standout one then is the command point farming. Let's look at the generic warlord traits. These are not dynastic specific. Um, the first one is reduced damage inflicted on your warlord by one. So if you get three damage on him, it's dropped to two. Eternal Madness, you can re-roll failed wound rolls for your Warlord in the fight phase if he charged, was charged, or provoked, performed a heroic intervention. Immortal Pride, units within six inches of your Warlord automatically pass morale test. That one's pretty big. In addition, your Warlord can attempt to deny one psychic power in the psychic phase in the same manner as a Psyker. That one's pretty big. I know leadership 10 means that Necrons don't necessarily take morale very often, but there are many occasions where you really, really want to punish a Necron unit and he's only got two or three guys left in that unit. And then taking a morale test on them when you've lost eight guys can really sting you. And this this will stop you taking those morale tests. And then with reanim reanimation protocols, getting back up into the fight is nice. Uh, Thrall of the Silent King, increase the range of all ability on your Warlord's data sheet by 3 inches. Um, Implacable Conqueror, you can re-roll failed charge rolls for friendly dynasty units while they were, are within 6 inches of your Warlord. That one's pretty huge as well, particularly if you get in that um, uh, dynastic code that allows you to re-roll all hit rolls when you charge. So imagine re-rolling all hit rolls when you charge and also re-rolling all failed charges so long as you're within six inches of your Warlord. We know that's a good one as well because there's that Grey Knight um, Warlord trait. I think it's called First of the Fray, which allows Grey Knights to go charging in and re-rolling their charges. That's 
often taken by Grey Knight Grandmasters for a reason, because it's good. And then Honourable Combatant. If your Warlord targets the same enemy character with all of their close combat attacks, add D3 to your Warlord's attacks characteristics till the end of the phase. Now that one's very narrative, very fluffy, but we're never going to see it. Right, going back in and having a look at the data sheets, I think I've mentioned all of the most significant changes already. So there's a couple of other things that have changed, such as Imatech has got plus one strength when he punches stuff. Canatep Scarabs now have the fly keyword. But I think I've mentioned the most significant things, the Doomsday Arcs having the extra attack, Void Blades giving you an additional attack every time you fight with the weapons, not just Praetorians, but Lords. The number of shots destroyers put out now, four up and vulnerable save on the thingy bob. Big floaty vault thing with the star god trapped inside it. But none of the HQs have really changed unless I'm missing something. Night scythes and Tesla destructors still doing what they're doing. Ghost arcs still doing what they're doing. The real magic in this book comes from the, the way dynastic codes will shape the way your army functions and the different builds that you can bring and also the way some of those stratagems will complement and stack with some of those dynastic codes. And one minute, I just remember the Transcendence of Catan has a, a new ability. It used to have Writhing Worldscape. It's changed a bit. It's got Fractured Personality now. So before the battle, you pick one of the abilities opposite and apply for the rest of the battle. Alternatively, you can roll 2d6 to randomly determine two abilities and apply them both. However, duplicate results have no effect. So let's have a look at these six abilities. You can pick one or roll a dice and have two. And it goes like this. Cosmic Tyrant. You can use two powers of the Catan at the end of each of your movement phases instead of only one. So you're going to be picking that one. Because <laughs> this Transcendent Catan knows two powers of the Catan and can only use one. And then with Cosmic Tyrant, he knows two and can use two a turn. And they do mortal wounds. It's basically like psychic powers, but without having a roll and you can never perils. Uh, two is immune to natural, natural law. Add one to saving throws. Three is silent necrodermis. Regain D3 lost wounds at the start of each of your turn. And then you've got transdimensional displacement. When the model advances 12 inches to its move, add... When this model advances, add a 12 to its move characteristics instead of rolling a dice. So it moves 8. Add 12 to that. It's going to be moving 20. This guy's going to be getting about a bit if you get that one. That one's pretty handy as well. But nowhere near as good as Cosmic Tyrant. Entropic Touch. Reroll all failed wound rolls when he fights. Remember this guy's got his cracking tendrils. He's a strength user. Minus 4 AP D6 damage. And Writhing Worldscape, and you know what that one does. But basically, the Transcendent Catan can um, do two Psychic Powers a turn. Psychic Powers a turn, Powers of the Catan a turn. Right, back to the points. Let's start off with the Transcendent Catan. How much more do you have to pay for that awesome bit of goodness? Popping up two Powers a turn, well, it's minus seven points. He's got cheaper. The Nightbringer's gone down 20 points as well. The Shard of the Deceiver is still the same. How much? Does that um, big Tesseract Bolt. Remember it's now suddenly got a 4 up in Vulnerable save. It was 496 points. It's still 496 points. You're getting a 4 up in Vulnerable save for free. Wraiths however did go up in points cost. And I should think so too. They're plus 17 more points more expensive. So that's over 50 points to bring them. And then when you tag on their war gear. Either the whip coils or the vicious claws or the particle casters. They're coming in north of 60 points a model. Um, but they're worth it. So then let's have a look at destroyers because they got awesome, remember. Now, Gauss cannons are still 20 points. Heavy Gauss cannons went down a little bit, I think about 5 points. And destroyers, they've gone down. They've gone down 13 points. Destroyers with a Gauss cannon used to be 63 points, something like that, and they couldn't shoot for Toffee. Uh, now they can really, really shoot, and they're really good, and they're 50 points, and they can hit the side of a barn door. So Destroyers are back. I've mentioned that already, but I really like the idea of Destroyers. I can just see lists with Destroyers and Wraiths in it. It's going to give me deja vu for 4th edition when that's all that anyone ever brought. Cryptex, 16 points cheaper. Deathmarks, 2 points cheaper. Destroyer Lords, 14 points cheaper. Overlords, 15 points cheaper. Tomb Blades are 10 points cheaper. They've gone down to 14 points. They're a bargain. 
Uh, Trek Praetorians, three points cheaper. Warriors are the same. Trike Stalkers are the same. Immortals, Lords, these guys are the same. Uh, Catacomb Command by same points. A quick note on Tomb Blades, by the way. They have got a new ability called Ev Evasion M-Grams. So your opponent must subtract one for hit rolls at target this unit in the shooting phase. They can still take Gauss Blasters, Particle Beamers, Tesla Carbines. But minus one to hit them and 14 points to pop before you add on the war gear. Let's add on the war gear. No, I was just checking, double checking there. The points of the guns are still the same. They come with Gauss Blasters, a pair of Gauss Blasters, which are nine points for pop. So that's 18 points for the two Gauss Blasters. Um, you add that to the cost of the Tomb Blades. That's 32 points for a Tomb Blade, which is uh, 10 points cheaper. And it's minus one to hit them. So Tomb Blades are a thing now. You can still take Shadow Looms or nebula, nebula Scopes. The Shield Veins give them... Uh, uh, they can take shield veins and that's a 3 up save. The shadow loom gives them a 5 up and vulnerable save. Nebula scope is you don't get bonuses to their save for being in cover when you shoot at people. Let's have a look at the points cost of them. Shadow loom is still the same, 5 points for a 5 up and vulnerable save. But shield veins, which increase your save from 4 to 3. Well, shield veins used to be 6 points, but they're 3 points now. So they've gone down half price. So tomb blades are a thing, I like them. So that's 35 points with some shield veins. So 35 points. You've got something with a three up save, two Glauss Gauss Blasters, rapid fire one, strength five, minus two AP, dipping around all over the place with a move of 14. Three up save, two wounds at toughness five, and it's minus one to hit them. Yeah, I'll take a couple of them, please. In your heavy slot, most of the heavies stayed the same, but Kinoptic Spider's gone down 11, Doomsday Arc down 10, Heavy Destroyer's down 13. Ghost Arc down 10, Doom Scythe down 15, Night Scythe down 14. So basically, about half of the units have gone down in points. The only thing that has gone up in points is the Wraiths by 17. And as they can fall back out of combat and still assault again, and as all of their attacks are now to a flat 2 damage at minus 2 AP, they should go up by 17 points. They still might be a little bit under-costed with that 3-up and vulnerable save. And the fact that they'll have a threat range of plus 20 inches because they can charge after they advanced with that one point stratagem. Uh, looking at the war gear, very few changes for the points in the war gear section. There's a couple of tweaks here and there, but essentially you're getting more bang for your buck. And the stuff that you want to, to take, such as um, uh, the destroyers, are cheaper. And tomb blades, cheaper. Uh, standard infantry, um, the same. I mean, there's some really scary builds in here. That Destroyer Lord has gone down, what was it, 14, 13 points? So he's re-rolling hit rolls of one, right? And if there's any Destroyers within six inches of him, then they re-roll their wound rolls of one. Destroyers re-roll their hit rolls of one anyway. So you're probably going to bring an unnamed Destroyer Lord from the Sakuth dynasty. Um, him. <laughs> These are the, so... That means your heavy guns on all your destroyers, they can move and fire without penalty. And destroyer Lord, chuck them in there. So everyone's re-rolling hit one, rolls of one and firing three times and hitting on threes instead of four. Everyone's re-rolling wound rolls of one, chucking a couple of heavy destroyers in your list as well. Um, tag on about 28,000 race to that list and then a few mobs of uh, um, troops to fill out your slots. And you've got a very, very frightening list um at higher points games or just for fun bring along a tesseract bolt or a transcendence of katan and um, have them doing their thunderbolt stuff and all their psychic power shenanigans and when i say psychic powers i mean powers of the katan that thing remember the katans are characters you can't target them they've got less than eight wounds they can't be targeted so long as they're not the closest enemy unit so having a transcendent katan there firing out multiple powers of the Catan um, in the middle of a destroyer bubble yeah there's some lists in here I mean I did just reading through this book and the points reductions and and some of the rules and some of the combinations here really really got my gray matter thinking I think anyone who's picking up a forge bane box set recently are going to find different ways of playing this army and some very interesting builds and for those old school necron players 
that were waiting for a good codex. Well, I think you've got a good codex. In my humble opinion, you've got, you've got a good codex. The units are still doing what they're doing. There's some tweaks to the units I've mentioned that are still doing what they're doing, but the ways to play have definitely improved. Um, I'll shut up now. I think this one's probably a very long one. Thank you very much for listening to this video. Thank you for Games Workshop for sending through the book in advance. Thank you to all my patrons for supporting me. You guys are awesome. Um, happy Wargaming.